winter day in California. <laughs> uh, before we begin, we have people from all over the world to visit our butterfly groves. So it's kind of fun to find out where people are from. So as I walk by, just look at the California. California. Yeah. India. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, you're welcome. Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. China. China. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Okay. San Diego. California. Same group, huh? Chocolate. Hey. Chocolate. San Francisco, North Carolina. Me. California. 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 That's all right. I'm California. <laughs> Michigan. Okay. Well, hello everyone. My name is Gary Eskill. I'm a California State Park docent here at the Smithville Beach Monarch Grove. I'd like to welcome all of you to the most visited monarch road in the world. In the four months we're here, we get over 100,000 visitors. Now in the tech, next 20 minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you why this grove is an oasis to these monarch butterflies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use each letter out of the word oasis to explain and to help you remember the importance of this grove. After I conclude my talk, I'll be available to answer any additional questions that you might have. So, let's begin with a definition of what an oasis is. According to the dictionary, an oasis is any place or thing offering welcome relief as from difficulty. I'll read that again. According to the dictionary, an oasis is any place or thing offering welcome relief as from difficulty. And the difficulty these little fellers are facing is to survive through the winter. So I'll put this right here. And this begins with the first letter of the word oasis to help you remember how important this grove is. And that letter is O. What makes this grove an oasis to these monarch butterflies? Three characteristics you're looking for. Number one, good wind protection. That's what the eucalyptus trees provide. That's what the Monterey cypress trees that have been re recently planted provide. Good wind protection. Number two, we're looking for a water source to prevent dehydration. For those of us in California, that, that's a good question. <laughs> but we get the marine layer comes in, fortunately, and there's a native plant garden behind you. And so the marine layer will bring in dew drops and you'll see some of the butterflies, especially in the morning, fly over to get a drink. Now, when we do have rain, there is a stream that runs between the grove and the camp. Third thing they're looking for is cool, humid temperatures, such as we have here next to the ocean. Additionally, the ocean air will circulate to prevent freezing, yet it's cool enough to slow down their body functions so that they'll remain as inactive as possible when they arrive. A good way to understand what they're looking for is they like the temperature of a refrigerator, but they cannot stand the temperature of a freezer. And that brings us to the next letter out of the word oasis to help you remember how important this grove is. And that letter is A. As in arrival, when do these little sellers begin to arrive? Well, in October, these fall butterflies begin to arrive here to avoid, to avoid freezing temperatures. And that's because monarchs cannot survive freezing temperatures for a long period of time. Now, in my talk, I refer to the butterflies we have here as the fall generation, because as you'll hear in my talk, there is a difference between the butterflies that generation of, of butterflies in the fall and the other generation. Okay. Now the details of how they arrived here is uncertain, but scientists think they rely on the Earth's magnetic field and the changing angle of the sun to navigate the places such as we have here. Most of the time when you see them fly, they fly about 10, 50 miles an hour, usually within 200 feet off the ground, but they have been seen fly as high as 5,000 feet by glider pilots. Mm. 
They think what they do is they catch thermals like hawks do, and that's how they can travel such long distance. Now, <clears throat> these little fellows with gorgeous cells are nectar during their journey, so when they arrive here, they got a large amount of body fat. And upon arrival, they go into a state of semi-hibernation. That's what you see them doing in the grove right now. They're in that semi-hibernated state. Technical term is diapause. And it's during this phase, they'll become very inactive as their metabolism is significantly slowed down. Additionally, this generation, the butterflies we have here in this grove, this fall adult butterfly, will live up to eight months. Whereas, its spring and summer offspring only live two to six weeks. Also, unlike the spring and summer butterflies, these butterflies cluster. That's what you see them in there in the grove right now, clusters. They're, as one person referred to, look like a bunch of tree hanging couch potatoes waiting out the winter. That's that clustering behavior. Okay, now the clustering behavior is now well understood, but scientists believe they do it to protect them from gusty winds because they can knock them to the ground, which has to be 55 degrees or above from the fly. So protection gusty winds, when we do get rain, it works like shingles, the water just runs off. And the other uh, belief is, when you look at them, I think all of you notice it's like dead leaves. Well, that's for protection against birds or predators. Now, in this grove right now, most of them are clustered on the eucalyptus trees, which are blue gum eucalyptus, by the way, and the, some of them are on the cypress trees. They also cluster on Monterey pines, Torrey pines, and the butterflies that overwinter in Mexico, they cluster on fir trees. Now, let me point out, let me point out that there are two, two populations of monarch butterflies in the United States. The ones we have here are from west of the Rocky Mountains. They come from as far north as Canada and as far east the Rocky Mountains. But we think most of them come from around the Sierra Nevada region. Now the ones most people are familiar with when you turn on television, read a magazine, get a book, are the ones east of the Rockies. They overwinter in Mexico. Butterflies east of the Rockies overwinter in Mexico. Butterflies west of the Rockies overwinter in California and places like this. Hmm. And that brings us to the next letter out of the word oasis. Help you remember how important this globe is. And that letter is S. S as in springtime. For spring is when the monarchs have left the globe. Now, they begin to leave in February, which also has a certain holiday that, let's just say, a, a, a wise husband would remember. And I'm not talking about Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> Anybody know what holiday it might be? Groundhog Day! Day. That's oh. Right, Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, monarchs don't use the same calendar we do. In fact, you might say they celebrate Valentine's Day for the whole month of February. You come here on a nice spring day, actually a day like this, and I guarantee some of you would hear that old 70s tune, Love is in the Air, because that is what's happening. Now let me show you what these love bugs look like. Here's the male. I'll show you a female in a minute. But one, the two things you'll notice the difference, the male has thinner veins and has these two little dots, which are scent glands. The scent glands were used for mating purposes, but as they evolved over time, it serves no uh, useful uh, use for mating for the monarchs. Uh, but there are other butterflies that have scent glands, which it does serve a purpose, but not monarchs. Okay, here's the dots oh, okay. right here. Yeah, the two dots. And then the, the veins here, let me show you the female. The main thing you notice, the female has thicker veins. Yeah. Thicker veins and the dots. The dots are the big giveaway. What it is gives that appearance of thicker veins, and the female has another set of scales. And the scales do the coloring. Like on each wing is about a million scales to give them the color. And the pattern is around the 
Yeah. A afterwards, I'll be happy to go over any questions. Thank okay. you. Okay. Now it's the male that initiates the mating by approaching the female while in flight. He captures the female. They both float to the ground. Then he takes her up to his penthouse in the trees <laughs> where the mating takes place. Now both the male and the female will mate repeatedly with other monarchs, and then and then they both start leaving the goal, as I mentioned, that's in February. So the female leaves first, and what she is looking for is milkweed plant. We don't have a milkweed plant on display, but because the native milkweed plant dies out in the fall, reseeds itself, and is now reappearing in the spring. But it's milkweed plant, only milkweed plant, that's the only plant she'll lay her eggs on because that's the only plant the little caterpillar will eat is milking plant. She'll lay about two to 400 eggs on numerous plants, and then in about three or four days, egg will hatch, and this tiny little caterpillar will appear. Now, let me tell you about this little caterpillar. This little caterpillar is one mean eating vegetarian machine. It eats almost day and night for 15 days. This caterpillar grows from 1 16th of an inch. See that tip that pin? That's 1 16th of an inch. In 15 days, it goes from 1 16th of an inch to 2 inches. That is 2 inches. Its body weight increases 2,700 times. I repeat that. In 15 days, its body weight increases 2,700 times. The better way to understand it is that there was a human baby the size of a whale in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> now, also during this feeding frenzy, in the milkweed plant, there are toxins that go into the little caterpillar's body. So, uh, it carries over to the adult butterfly, mainly into the adult butterfly's wings, which is the most toxic part in there. So, once a bird as large as blue jays or scrub jays like we have here uh, samples a monarch's wing, they usually get ill and vomit. Therefore, once a predator discovers this toxicity, they usually leave monarchs alone. That's why you don't see a bunch of birds feasting on our monarch butterflies because of this toxicity. Now, after 15 days in this feeding frenzy, the caterpillar will seek out a strong leaf or twig to hang from relaxes, starts to form this J. The J starts getting, over a period of hours, starts getting darker, and there's an outer ectoskeleton that will break away, and then what you have is this chrysalis. And if you've never seen one, they're really beautiful. Looks like a piece of J, and the most amazing thing, when you look at it, is the gold on top, looks like 14 karat gold. Really beautiful. And that brings us to the next letter out of the word oasis. Help you remember how important the scroll is. And that letter is I. I. For inside this chrysalis, one of the most fascinating things about butterflies takes place. This caterpillar will release chemicals that changes and totally rearranges all of its cells to create a totally new shape. And this process, as many of you know, is called metamorphosis. Think about it. It's a physical transformation. It goes from a leaf-eating caterpillar, slow-moving caterpillar, to become a flying butterfly that now feeds on nectar. Now this amazing process takes about 10 to 15 days, depending on the weather conditions. Then this chrysalis is split open, and its wing beauty will appear. Now, what I'd like you to do I want you to visualize this as the first monarch generation of the year, the spring butterfly. The first offspring of the butterflies we have here, right? This would be the spring generation. Now, these descendants, um, these butterflies, so I mentioned, only live two to six weeks. They're going to lay their eggs, and those butterflies are going to take off, and they only live two to six weeks. And each generation will be flying in a northeastern direction as the native milkweed starts appearing. 
there's at least four generations of butterflies occur in a year's time. Most, a lot of books will say five generations, but the biologists and modern just grow so it's much better, closer, more accurate to say four, at least four generations, or four to five generations in a year's time. So keep in mind, when you go back to the grove and you look up and you see these butterflies flying around, they just might be the great, great grandchildren of last year's butterflies. <laughs> and that brings us to the last letter out of the word oasis. To help you remember how important this grove is, and that letter is sanctuary. Sanctuary. Next year, around September, as daylight hours start getting shorter, as temperatures become cooler, and even another important thing, the native milkweed plants start dying out. It's all these environmental conditions, such as these, the star butterflies like we have here in this cove, this fall generation, to begin their journey. They'll emerge from the chrysalis, and as soon as they're able to fly, They'll start flying in a southwestern direction to gorge themselves on nectar during their journey until they finally arrive at a sanctuary. Already is a word I think is more specific until they finally arrive at an oasis like we have right here at Chisholm Beach. This concludes my talk. I want to thank all of you for being here. I recommend you check out our trailer. Thank you. Gonna ask questions? I thought we were gonna have. I thought, oh, individual questions. Look but don't touch. Okay, that's a very good question because a lot of it, you know, to tell you the truth, you know, uh, a lot of it is just speculation, you know, by scientists, etc. But there are four significant overwintering, overwintering sites. Look at that, 200 from Mendocino to Baja overwintering sites. That has about four significant ones. And they, they all have the three things that I mentioned, but. Um, why did why did they come specifically to a place they'd never been to before? Five generations later, nobody really truly knows. It's just one of the mysteries. You know, they, all I can say is, if, if, you know, what like I mentioned, it offers good wind protection, the water source, and the being close to the ocean. But why there aren't other places that would be as large as this? That is something that. You know, the butterflies know and we don't speak their language. That's but it's a good, very good question. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you for coming. Do you have a question? Yeah. First of all, thank you for the talk. Oh, well, thank you for coming. Uh, I had a question. I was wondering, like you mentioned, this is one of the most visited yeah. Leonard groves. Yes, it is. So is the increase in human visiting population affecting the... It's butterflies? Yeah. You see that yeah, the count has gone down. Really well, okay, in the last 20 years, the population gone down okay, let's go take a picture. throughout the United States by 90%. Okay, our population, west of the Rockies, loss of habitat, certainly the the, um, the fires that we've been having are not going to help. But the main thing has always been loss of habitat, the use of pesticides, insecticides. But the big thing is this drought we're in. Because the native milk we plant, even when we have good rains, say in the winter, you gotta have those uh, showers in the, in the summer, you know, to keep that plant going, and it's not happening. There's a lot of organizations now, like the National Wildlife Federations and others, that are trying to uh, come up, you know, helping with programs, planting uh, more milkweed. Now, the population east of the Rockies, the ones that overwinter in Mexico, there's a couple problems there. One is the overwintering site used to be about 45 acres. Now, because of logging, down to about two acres. Then when they fly 
uh, out to these cornfield areas and soybean fields when they leave uh, to lay eggs where there used to be milkweed it's not there because of these genetically modified corn you know where they can spray and it kills everything on it so that's part of the big big, big problem yeah. so right now they're working on a petition uh, to have them classified as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act, but to get all the information required, it, it takes quite a bit of time. Yeah. Well, I'd also like to thank you, well, thank you. and ask you if it would be okay if I were to uh, put your presentation on Santa Maria Civic Television on the Channel 25 on Comcast Cable. If you wish. All right. Um, can I get a shot of your name tag? Yes. If I can put a graphic up there on the show. Gary, how do I see your last name? Espio, like the letters S, P, and O. Espio. Yep. All it's right. Basque. French Basque. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for doing what yeah, you do. Do you work on the show? Or? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm the producer of the show. It has, doesn't exist yet, but I'm putting it together yeah. starting this week. Oh, okay. And it's going to be called What's Up Santa Maria oh, because cool. I don't have a better title yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Well, I'll be honored to be on there. Thank Thanks, you. Gary.